everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you, Selena. Good. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order at 6 o'clock, and we'll start tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance. Our flag's over there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great, I feel like I'm gonna sing for you or something, it's a little <laughs> awkward. Um, can you hear me if I talk over here? Does it pick up? It does pick up, okay. So um, we're gonna start our meeting tonight. We don't have a ton of people um, attending, but we do have about eight who have signed up so far who would like to speak tonight. Our uh, public input session will be after the superintendent reports and the SAU um, uh, administrative report. So, cause I think most people wanna hear about our opening plans and the discussion around that. So I'm trying to put it in the agenda where it's the most productive. Um, I do want to say, though, that if some of you have attended some of the other meetings that we've had at the SAU and the joint board sessions or the co-op sessions, they've been a bit unruly, um, I would say rowdy, and in some cases disrespectful. So I would really like to ask and remind everybody that we are all neighbors. We see you in, in the stores. You see us. Um, uh, and I think it's important that we maintain that level of decorum. And also, just so everybody knows, we're all moms up here. <laughs> we all have kids in the school. Mine are a little bit older. Um, they're in the high school, but um, everybody else, I think, has kids in the, in the SMS school. Um, so I just wanted to give an example of what I think is you know, appropriate behavior. And I was thinking, in prep for this meeting, I'd like to see everybody behave at least as well as my kids do. <laughs> and I think as parents, we all know what we expect of our uh, children, how they behave in public. Um, and I was just thinking a few things to call out. I always tell my kids, use your words, right? No tantrums and hollering and whatever. Say what you have to say. Um, inside voice, we have mics tonight so we can hear everybody well, and we're in the, in the gym, so it's really going to echo. Um, so let's modulate our voices and make sure we're um, doing that correctly, as we would expect our kids to. Um, and always speak with respect for the person you're speaking to and for those who are around you listening as well. Um, in my... Uh, Grandma Langemeyer. My Grandma Langemeyer was born in 1896, so she was old and she died several years ago, but her guidance was always, um, don't say anything that you wouldn't repeat in front of your grandmother in church. So if we could just remember that as people, you know, we are recording and we are also using the network tonight so that people can watch from home, um, I would really appreciate it if we could you know, maintain that sense of decorum and set good examples for our kids and for our neighbors as well. Okay, so with that, the first thing we have on our agenda is the very exciting approval of minutes. Uh, and we have the minutes of June 9th. Anybody have any adjustments? I have a couple. Any edits? I'll jump in because I do have a couple. Erin, you usually have a couple good ones. Um, so we have Selena's name spelled incorrectly at the top. Uh, we're missing an A right after, right after uh, R, if that's the case. Um, under 4.2, we have an extraneous if. Ms. Magri asked if the board if. I think we need one if. Ask the board if. So we can delete that first if. Oh, golly, it's hot. Um, 4.3, I believe Alice is all caps. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. who's, our, who's safety? That's, yeah, it is. It's all caps. Okay, if we could make that all caps. Um, 4.5, if we could insert the dollar sign in front of 240.701. And then 4.6, we have a, an extraneous Ms. Evely at the end of that paragraph. We can strike that. Oh, I think that was it. Okay, that was it that I found. Anybody else? You're on it. Nothing else? Okay. Um, that's the only set of minutes we have tonight, so can we get a motion to accept those minutes as amended? I'll make such a motion, and I'll second it. Thank you. So, motion by Sarah, second by Carissa. Um, any discussion? No? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Everybody aye? Okay, so we're five zero zero. It's a little awkward for us to be yeah. like this it's not, and not looking at each other. Okay, so that's 
speedily moving uh, through that. Next, we have our superintendent report. So I would ask Esther. Sure, everybody hear me okay? Welcome, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, my only part of my report tonight is in lieu of the opening school plans and what the SAU is recommending as far as operating, et cetera, and then Kate will speak to the specifics of a Strata Memorial School, like lunch, recess, et cetera. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank the community for working so hard with the schools to keep our transmission rate low, keep our kids and our teachers and all of you safe and healthy as possible. So we really appreciate, we know last year was trying and um, we just thank you for pulling together with your community and making it as successful as possible. So thank you for that. We hope to continue that, obviously, um, with keeping all of our kids in school. That is our main priority in making the recommendations that we're making tonight to open with all of our students, no alternating days, no um, schedules that are reduced, so normal school days, things like that. That's really our goal and that's what we base this recommendation on because we recognize, and as all of you do, that our students, the social, emotional, and the academic importance of that is having our kids in school every day. So that's our goal. Having said that, I'm just gonna kind of quickly overview some highlights we have for recommendations. One, of course, is the operating model. We will offer in-person learning only. There will be not a remote option. That we have one in our community, the Virtual Learning Academy, that does now teach lower grades, elementary grades, so that is an option for parents should they choose to go remote. Um, but we will not be offering a remote option because all of our kids will be in school, so we need all of our staff and teachers in the building. Um, we also hope that for masks and facial coverings, I'm actually gonna leave that to the end because I have a matrix for some of the administration to help pass out. So I'm gonna go with physical distancing next. We are working on that three feet of physical distancing, which is what's recommended now. Again, that allows us for Stratum to bring everyone in every day. So there are some logistics, and I think Kate will speak to those to get as close to that as possible at all times. Um, obviously, one area is on our buses, which was similar to last year when we returned. Uh, speaking of buses, we do have to mask our students on the bus. That is a federal law because it's considered public transportation. So we don't have any um, say or wiggle room around that. That is a federal law, and so if your student is riding the bus, they will be expected to mask at all times when they're on the school bus. Field trips and school events, uh, that's gonna be a case-by-case -case basis, really determining the, the how large is the crowd, where is the field trip to, is it outside, is it inside, all of those, um, what mitigating factors are in place at the location of the field trip, such as HVAC systems and things we have in our schools. So that'll be case-by-case. -case. Thinking uh, about the school building use or visitors, I know that's also on the agenda for the board to discuss. Right now, where um, groups and teams seeking to use the facilities will be permitted to do so without any additional cost. Last year, some had to pay an additional um, custodial fee because the cleaning was more expensive, extensive. So that is not um, going to be charged this year for outside groups that want to use our buildings. They would also refer to the building use forms, which is on the SAU 16 facilities uh, and management department. They handle all the building use. I spoke to the operating model, which is in person every day for all of our students. Moving on. The other mitigating factors we're strongly going to have in place are frequent hand washing. We'll also have our HVACs and our um, same filters that will help. Those mitigating factors will continue to be in place. We'll have the custodial cleaning, as always, that will be in place. Um, ventilation, which is part of that filter system, the MERV 13s. So those are all continuing to be put in place as mitigating factors. Some of you may be wondering about the contact tracing, quarantining, or exclusion from school. As it stands now, the recommendation from health professionals and the state is that individual students and whole classrooms will no longer be excluded for quarantine in the event of a positive COVID case. Unvaccinated family members of students who test positive 
or whose classmates tested positive for COVID-19 should consult the quarantine guide for unvaccinated people exposed to COVID-19 in their household. That's the difference now. It's in their household. In the event of an outbreak, the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services may impose a quarantine, but that's really up to um, the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. So we won't be having to quarantine whole classrooms if there's a positive case. It really gets down to that student's household and who quarantines and if they're vaccinated or unvaccinated within that household. Um, so that's good news. All activities such as music, drama, athletics, clubs, etc., will operate in person with the standard mitigation measures in place. Um, and as for indoor activities, those are going to be on a case-by-case -case basis and um, really handed to the building administration. Again, is there space? Is there three feet? What's that look like? Things like that. The final thing that I want to speak to are masks. So if you could all pass out the matrix. Just want to say Dr. Ryan is here and I'd like to thank him for the work he's done developing this matrix with other superintendents across the state. Um, they did a great job consulting with um, many health professionals, our public health, local public health professionals, local physicians, as well as um, the APA and the CDC. And um, this was also vetted by Dr. Chan, who you may have seen numerous times on the television, who is the uh, doctor that speaks for the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. So as you get that matrix, you can see across the top. Does everybody have one? Oh, I have one and it's just not in color. Okay. Sorry. Do you need a color one? I have one. Okay. Yeah, you can take one and pass it down. We all set. Do you need one? Everybody good? Everybody have one? Great. So you can see the atop the cross of that matrix is level of community vaccination. Um, I just looked it up on you, and anyone can go to that link that's listed at the top and get this. Is why I'm looking at my phone because I took a screenshot of it so I wouldn't have to try to open my computer. Um, so right now in the town of Stratum. The, num the percentage of individuals fully vaccinated is 63.5%. The amount that have had at least one dose, the percentage is 68.3%. So, so you can see, if you go to this matrix, it is the below 70% across the top. Now if you go to the level of community transmission, which is by region, the state does not supply us a town by town community rate transition, it's by region. So that's what we're using um, off of the DOE, uh, Department of Health and Human Services webpage. So you, again, you can go to that site on the top and you can call up maps and it'll call all the state maps up and then there's a list of different things you can click on like percentage vaccinated and if you click on that, it'll change the states for you and then you can go to either the town or the region depending how they, uh, have gathered the data. So if you look at the level of community transition, the minimal is new cases over the last 14 days per 100,000, equals less than 50, and test positive over the last seven days is less than 5%. So um, you can go down and see what moderate is, that's increased amount, and substantial is new cases over the last 14 days per 100,000 is greater than 100, or the test positive positivity rate over the last seven days is greater than 10%. So if you go right now to um, the COVID dashboard and schools, you will see that the entire state of New Hampshire is red, which means they are in every region is in um, substantial. So if we were to open school tomorrow using this matrix, kids, everybody would mask. Kids, teachers, everyone would mask. The matrix does allow, and this is what we're recommending, allow for flexibility. So if the community level of transmission decreases to moderate, you can see that you would go across and you would see it's recommended for unvaccinated, but again, not everyone. So the only time is when we're in that substantial range, as you can see that red. So this does allow for flexibility. So certainly the SAU is not recommending mandated masks. What we're recommending is use of this matrix, which again has been vetted by the New Hampshire Department of uh, Health and Public Services, Dr. Chan, local um, health 
providers. Um, so we're, I think, the first to admit that we aren't experts in the area of health, and so we have to consult with the experts, and we feel recommending this matrix gives us flexibility throughout the year, depending on if all of a sudden 12-year-olds can get vaccinated, and that reduces the transmission rate and ups the um, percentage of vaccinated. So that's why we're recommending a matrix, not a standalone um, one or the other. So that being said, that's what the SAU is recommending in terms of the operating pieces. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kate to speak to the more specific Strata Memorial opening school plans. Can we pause stuff while we do that? Sure, it's up to you. I, I'd kind of like to talk about this now rather okay. than after Kate's presentation. Great. Um, I'm going to jump right in. I feel like, and I was looking at these numbers, and I feel like we have uh, masked our kids for a long time. And when I look at these numbers, I get really emotional about this because I don't want to see our kids uh, in masks for another year. Um, when I apply these numbers to Stratum, and I looked up the data today, the definition of minimal, because we only have about 7,500 people in the stratum population. So when you extrapolate that to 100,000 people, you can only have up to three cases in the whole town to be minimal, three or less. Moderate, you can only have no more than seven. And substantial, you get to that when you have eight cases. They're really low numbers. It's and I understand the CDC and the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, they have an objective of you know, getting rid of this, making sure no more people die, um, and really stop it, you know, trying to stop this virus. But I feel like in our little town, our little microcosm, we've, you know, the adults have stepped up and gotten vaccinated, our teachers have stepped up and gotten vaccinated. Our, we've wrapped our kids in this little cocoon, and I, um, I would rather not look at this broader community exposure, and I'd rather look what's going on in Stratum, and I'd also rather set guidelines that feel more reasonable, quite honestly. Um, to me, eight people in the last 14 days getting COVID doesn't feel like substantial, substantial infection. So I know that all the little towns get penalized this way. If you're a big town, you know, it's not quite as bad, but the numbers explode when you're, you know, when you do the math and you're small. Um, so I would, I, and I, I just want to go on a little bit more, sorry. Um, when I look at the numbers of how many kids in the zero to nine cohort across the whole state, they haven't even made up 1% of the hospitalizations and there have been zero deaths. Same is true for kids up to 19 zero deaths and not even one percent of hospitalizations i mean i feel like um our kids are bearing the brunt of it especially the little ones they need to talk they need to see their friends laughing they need to know if their friends sticking their tongue out at them you know you need to hear them clearly it's a long day so my i would prefer if we could find a way to open schools without masks required knowing that when we get to holidays, we're probably gonna have to change it, right? If we could have, a, my thought would be, if we could have a window where kids start school without required masks, and if parents are not comfortable with that, I certainly wouldn't have a problem with them saying, you know, my kid needs a mask. Okay, that's fine. Um, but to try to give them a window of normalcy before we get to the holidays, because we're gonna hit the dead of winter and we're probably gonna have to mask up and we probably won't see uh, no masks until April again. It's a long school year. So I know the numbers won't work out the way everybody has vetted these. Um, I did work out some numbers myself, but honestly, I feel like uh, we could have a work session to come up with a better matrix to help make decisions. We don't have to settle it tonight, but I did create something, but I'm not, you know, I did it in like half an hour, so I'm not 100% certain that um, it's the best thinking and we haven't all, you know, thought about it. but. Um, it feels, to me, it feels like substantial should be 1% of the population, which is still only 75 people. 
And I know the CDC would flip out, right? <laughs> but can we do that? Can we be more reasonable? Uh, or something that we think works for stratum? So I would like to have that conversation. But one of the things we are going to do tonight, we're going to have discussion up here. And we're going to hear Kate's presentation. And then we're going to open it up for public point of view and input. Um, and then we'll have our votes. We're thinking of having our votes afterwards, not voting now and then hearing. We're just trying to make it all fit together. Um, but that's where my head is. Anybody else? Kate? OK, so I agree with you on a lot of that. Um, I, I first I want to thank the public for reaching out to us and all the emails and um, phone calls and just conversations I've had with people, even if it's been in a grocery store. Um, because I, I feel like the majority of parents want their kids to have the option to wear the mask. They want to make the choice. And so as an elected official, I want to do that. Um, but it's our job as a school board to make sure that they're safe. So I did a lot of research um, and I consulted a local uh, physician who helped lead me in the right direction of statistics and things like that. Um, so I'm going to read this because it's, I won't be able to remember it all if I don't. Um, but I'll, hopefully it'll just take a minute or two. So I'm very concerned that our children need a sense of normalcy. I don't believe that instilling fear in children that they will get sick or make someone else sick is helpful in any way at all. I think it's damaging. Um, I'm worried about the kids uh, that are coming here for the first time and the preschoolers and kindergartens and first graders and I don't want them to show up wearing a mask not being able to see their teacher's smiling face. I'm worried about the children that can't read social cues, um, children with speech disorders, um, children with sensory disorders, and then just overall the social and emotional welfare of masking and what it does to kids. Um, so anyway, so I did a little bit of research, so I'm just going to read a few things, but the, the number one thing is COVID is not going away. This is, we're going to be dealing with this for years. Um, and so I, I, I went to the um, American Academy of Pediatrics and right on their website, they state that at this time it appears that severe illness due to COVID-19 is uncommon among children. Um, I know we're worried about the Delta variant. Um, although the Delta variant is more transmissible, there's no data supporting that the Delta variant is making people sicker at this point. Um, and here's a, 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 an article that I found um, from Dr. Yvonne Muldoon, professor of pediatrics at Stanford, direct quote, I'm not seeing any patterns that suggest the virus is more virulent or more serious than before the variant appeared. That was just last month. Um, states reporting high numbers of the Delta variant show that less than 2% require hospitalization and 0.00 to 0.003% were fatal. Um, and then finally, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, 4.41 million children have tested positive for COVID. 0.00% to 0.03 have resulted in deaths. And more children have died from the flu from 2017 to 2020 than in the entire pandemic. So in this research, what I'm hearing is that kids are going to get COVID and they will have milder symptoms than adults. Um, and you know, we, we did the, the population that was most at risk was the elderly and people that had comorbidities um, that would get sicker if they contracted COVID have now had ample opportunity to be vaccinated. And I feel um, just overall that it's, and, and, and on top of it, parents want to make that choice is what I'm hearing. So I, it seems safe to do this. This is a fluid situation. If data starts coming out saying the Delta variant is making kids sicker, we can hold an emergency board meeting and change our recommendation at any time. So I just, I just want to follow the data and not get pulled into the emotion and the politics um, and the fear, which is what I think we really just have to look at the numbers when making these decisions. So, anyway. Okay, so far. Anybody else? <laughs> Comments? I'm just happy to hear this. I guess I, the comment that I have is this, is that everyone has a personal opinion about mm -hmm. this. And I feel, um, I feel honored to be able to be on the board, but I also feel like this was a community decision. As a community, I think each and every parent should have a say in, in their own children. But I also respect the fact that one child not wearing a mask can affect another child who is wearing a mask, and there's so many variables. And I guess the, the point that I'm trying to say is more of a suggestion. Um, and I don't even know if it's a possibility because I know a common feeling this past year is that parents aren't heard. 
community members, stakeholders aren't heard, and you should be heard, especially when it comes to something this personal. I don't know if it's possible, and I don't even know if the board would entertain it, but I know other school districts, other states are surveying their parents, hearing what you're saying. What's the majority? What do we want? If it's 50, 50%, 51% or more wants masks, well, maybe that's something we should consider. But, and I know it's not ideal, and I know everyone has their own opinions, but we need to hear what parents want. Because it is their children, we, if we say we're gonna mask, that we're slapping a mask on their face. Like, that's personal, that's close. You don't get any closer to me than telling me what to do with my kid. Um, so I think that it's important that we do obtain, we have all of this data, but to me what's most important is the data we get from our parents. Is a survey, is, is it's, that's something tangible to me. Um, so I would like to be able, whether it be now when we make a decision today, or we put that into a future discussion, I think it's a valuable needed information to move forward. Um, so again, I hear all these numbers, but I want customized, individualized, what, what our parents want. Um, and I love as a board that we're thinking in the gray because I think it's, everything is very black and white and it's about time we start thinking individualized and customized to Stratum. Um, just food for thought, and it doesn't require a response, it's just part of the puzzle. Um, I think it's, I mean, we've gotten some input. I think we all oh, have I know, gotten, I've gotten, gotten some input. input. And actually, <laughs> from the so Thank you. Know, so we, <laughs> Thank you, you know, for everyone. We've read all the emails. We're planning to include them in the minutes for this meeting as input to the board. Um, but I do think we need to have, because we are responsible for safety, we have to have a way to reverse course if we need to. I, because I, I don't think we can leave it up to everybody's individual desire in you know the dead of winter when it's, you know, if we have a huge spike and it's dangerous, we can't do that. I absolutely agree. I just think that, that those surveys numbers should be part of a consideration. It's part of a bigger picture. So just like each one number that you guys administer gave me, we should have, okay, this is what parents filled out. And not that that determines it, but it should factor into it. Because I would feel discounted as a parent, whether I think one way or another, because I honestly feel like our community is 50-50 from with the emails that I've gotten. But if the, if the info is 51.49? Then that's food for thought. It's valuable no matter what it is. It makes it harder, I mean, by far. But to me, that's valuable. And I think as a board, we need to start listening and considering. It doesn't mean that it makes the choice, it means that it's part of the puzzle. And that's something, like you said, maybe we can make a decision now and then go back to the drawing board, figure something else out. But I, I do think it's crucial information. Not the only information, but part of it. Anybody else? Any comments? Any? Any point of view? I'm gonna wait to hear Kate's okay. um, plans for masks and indoors and outdoors. And okay, so without that, we're, can, we, can we move on? Everybody mm -hmm. okay with that? Okay, mm -hmm. so let's move on to hear what Kate's plan is for opening and then we'll come back to the subject and make some decisions. After we hear the public. Yeah, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so just to be clear, um, our presentation is not about masks. Mm -hmm. so the, the presentation is whether you're masked and children and adults are masked or not. Everybody waiting to put some lights on. Priority. Um, the number one priority, of course, is the health and safety of our staff and our community. 
students. Um, we did have the Summer Learning Academy this summer, um, and it was clear from both the survey from our families, but also from the students, how important that connection, that social time with students, um, the face-to-face -face experiences, not only with just each other, but with the staff. So um, when I say um, educating your children, I mean educating your children in person. So that is our, number, our second priority after health and safety. Um, our daily schedule will look very much like it did actually pre-COVID, very typical daily schedule um, in terms of our arrival time, our dismissal time, um, the amount of instructional time your children will have in class, their related art schedules. Um, the really the bigger difference um, for your kids will be the lunch time, and that's the hardest time for us to schedule because of space. Um, so social distancing will obviously be practiced throughout the building. Um, but it means when we have lunch, we will have lunch, uh, one grade level will be in the gym and one grade level will be in the cafeteria. So that is atypical for us. Typically we would have two grades or two and a half grades in the cafeteria depending. Um, but in order to keep social distancing um, during the eating time and ensuring safety, we'll be in two spaces. So it will just take a little bit longer of the day, um, but we have worked it out so that it's not interrupting instructional time. So that's that second, or I'm sorry, the third slide you guys have in your bird packet. Um, we will, um, we are very fortunate, I don't know if you noticed on your way in, but we have the two tents reinstalled outside. Um, one of the major takeaways of our experience last year was how valuable outdoor education can be or what an important component it can be of our child's daily experience. Um, and so we had the tents um, put back up about a week ago so that we can continue to do more outdoor learning. Um, and as you know, the grounds are beautiful for all sorts of outdoor learning. So we tend to utilize that as much as possible. Um, last year, our PE teachers did their entire year outside. There was no, um, regardless, rain, shine, snow, they were out there enjoying um, our beautiful grounds. So we'll continue with those sorts of things um, this year as well. Um, we did, um, the board did approve some additional spaces that were renovated this summer to create, to create additional instructional space. Um, as you know, we're tight in this building. Um, there's a lot of bodies in, in space that's maybe not ideal right now for the current situation. Um, and so we have additional small space and small office space so we can spread people out continually throughout the year. And we moved, I think it was 19 um, classrooms this summer. Um, Additionally, we ripped up 19 rooms of carpets to create tile, again, for cleanliness um, for our students. <clears throat> um, I talked about lunch and recess, which is your next slide. Um, recess, last year we were cohorted by class. Towards the very end, we were cohorted by two classes. Um, this year, there'll be two grades at a time outside, so not just classes, but there'll be additional students outside. Um, those match our, our lunches. Um, because of the need to have uh, lunch in here, this will be the room where our older students eat lunch. We don't have enough um, cafeteria tables to support that, so we actually ordered those wonderful folding tables and these chairs. So our students in grades three, four, and five will be eating in here under, with those larger um, pieces of furniture, which means that, for example, um, our first lunch will be kindergarten students in the cafeteria and fourth grade students in here. Typically, we have students that are close in grade level at the same time, but unfortunately, in order to make it work, um, it'll be fourth and K outside at recess, and it'll be fourth and K eating at the same time. That's just another difference this year um, in order to keep the students and the staff safe. Um, drop off and pick up will be exactly like last year. Um, most of you are familiar with that. Um, drop off will be on the side of the building in the morning, um, and we'll be keeping K through two outside for about 20 minutes in the morning for their morning recess, and three to five will be going to their classrooms for their soft starts at that time. And then pick up in order to keep everybody outside um, will be where it was around the back of the building. I'm totally, comf I'm totally comfortable with whatever you'd like, Chris. If you wanna ask a question, please go ahead. So Trish Daly, the Director of Transportation, has been tirelessly working. Um, the families know we sent out a survey earlier this summer to try to get a better idea of how many families intended to. It was not a binding, it was just a survey to give us a rough idea. Is that still working? Yeah, so she's been working on the routes. At this time, I believe we'll have the same number of buses, which is 10, which is our typical, um, pre-COVID. Um, but I don't know exactly how that'll work out because there is a, there's a shortage of everything, of everyone, of every position. <laughs> Did you have a follow-up? Well, I, I was just going to say, if we're stuck with five, what do we do? But it sounds like we're, last year we only had five. I'll be calling you. <laughs> you don't want me driving. I'm from New York. <laughs> I'll call Aaron. Aaron will do it. My husband doesn't want me driving. 
some of the um, some of the general um, health and safety precautions and protocols that were in place last year will be in place this year, of course. Um, thank, thankful to the board who supports our small class sizes. Is, it's hugely beneficial right now. Um, it's beneficial at all times for excellent education, but it's especially beneficial right now. So our class sizes are anywhere from 15 to 20 right now, which makes it possible to keep that social distance within the classroom, which is really nice. Um, we did create a number of unique individual workspaces for some of our students that might need that or for situations for health and safety. We have more of those than we typically did. Um, of course, we'll continue with our hand hygiene, which at this point we all have dry, cracked hands because we're cleaning our hands so much. Um, I learned it's actually 20 seconds when you wash your hands, which I don't know if anybody's ever counted. It's an extremely long time, so you spend a lot more time in the restroom. Um, routine cleaning, um, our custodial staff and facilities director have been working 80 hours a week to get us ready and have been for over a year to keep our, our building clean and healthy. Um, we did have the MERV 13 filters, the bipolar ionizations all last summer, so those are still in place. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned the outdoor learning space and utilizing those as much as humanly possible um, throughout the day for our students and our staff. So those were the basic gist of what we're gonna do to keep students and staff safe. Um, I think our efforts are to return to as much of a typical experience as possible, but also taking the, you know, being really reflective of the lessons we learned last year and incorporating some of the best practices we learned, out, outdoor learning being one of them. Um, you know, there are lots of things that we're gonna take from that experience that are gonna make a better education now than we even had two years ago. I have a few questions too. You go ahead, Erin. Mine is really easy and I've just been curious about this. Since we got the tents, do teachers book them? Is there a schedule or is it everybody rush outside? and see who gets into the tent first. How, does this, how do the tents work and how did they work? So they were mostly utilized for um, outdoor eating. Um, so actually because of the grounds are so beautiful, we try to use, not use the tents if we don't need to, right? So if it was super hot, it was signed out. It was grade level specific or class, class specific, depending. Um, and they would sign it out or we had signed it, uh, signed it to them. Um, but other than that, they were trying not to be under the tents if they didn't have to. But you could be under there even if it was raining um, and still be outside. And as you remember in the spring during eating, it was still six feet, all kids were facing the same direction. So it was really utilized a lot. Um, but our hope is again to be outside as much as possible. Um, Mr. Saltis, who is a third grade teacher who's not here, has already all these plans he has for out there. He has, I mean, he has all new science inquiries that he'll be doing, um, you know, ecosystems and such. So they are utilized, um, but it's not a fight and a knockdown try fight for them, but they're utilized, yeah. I have a couple questions, sorry, I'm so sticky up here, it's so hot. Um, I noticed on the, the schedule for, and use kindergarten as an example, did I miss something? Don't we have kindergarten buses anymore? We don't do that anymore? No. No, they're on with all other students. They're with everyone else. So pre-K, our pre-K program has individual buses, but okay. our um, kindergarten, kindergarten rides with all the other a students. early with a little out. No, we don't nope. do that anymore. No. Nope. Okay, I missed that, sorry about that. Um, and you talked about recess cohorts, or did you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot of talking about that, um, and right now we're going to not we're going to try not to cohort at recess. Last year we did. We're going to try not to do that. Um, but again, it's going to be watching our numbers, watching all of those things. We really want kids to be able to play with other kids, and yeah. certainly it's great that you get to play with the kids in your classroom. And we saw huge bonds built with those kids last year. But we really want, like I said, as many typical experiences as possible for the kids. Um, I know there's been some guidance about if there's a cluster outbreak of three or more, that that would have some influence on that, but we're not there yet. Um, so I, another question about the classroom design. Um, are we still gonna have like desks set up and you know, everybody breathing in one direction? So, so social not? distancing is the expectation. Mm -hmm. um, there are times where kids can face each other, especially if they're six feet apart. So there, it really isn't about necessarily all facing the same direction. It's about that social distancing and really trying to keep kids, um, I don't mean separate, like stay away over there, but we really do want to honor that, especially if, we're, if the decision is not to be masked, we really want to honor that social distance. It's very important. Okay. Um. Can I just piggyback on the, the furniture? I'm just kind of curious how you're doing with furniture. Do you have enough furniture? I mean, schools throughout, just because we've gone from the tables to desks. So how are you doing? Even if you wanted to buy it, I'm not sure you could get it, but <laughs> I just want to check in. Yeah, so elementary education is not desks anymore. It hasn't been for probably yeah. you know five to 10 years. It's really been tables, right? So um, at the beginning of last year, we had tables every single way. We had, we had like two classroom sets of desks in storage. <laughs> Those were hot commodities. <laughs> um, so there's, in every room, there's a combination of furniture. There's some desks, there's some chairs. Um, 
And honestly, I, and I think most of you that would have spent time in an elementary classroom, that's probably appropriate, right? You want different type of seating, you want different areas. We're short on furniture, but we're making it work. Um, and every single thing is either backward or unavailable and has been for about 12 months. So wow. even if we need it a lot, there isn't available. I mean, that's why we're using folding tables in the gym for the cafeteria. <laughs> I guess I just bring it up, and maybe not for tonight, because I realize that you all want to speak, but um, just we're, we're entering into budget season, and we don't know how long they're going to have to be um, distanced for three feet, and so we might just want to have that conversation. Absolutely. What do related arts look like this year? So related arts is previous, like typical previous to COVID. So related arts are in the building, um, they're in their spaces, um, and then our students, as they always do, will rotate in every 45 minutes with a five minute transition in between to try to wipe things down and be clean. So they're in person, no Zoom art. You got Dow it. Dow is like handing them. If you had asked things. me to ask Caitlin Dow to be home again, <laughs> I, know. I would have taken cover behind you. <laughs> no, they're, th I mean, yeah, they'll I all be in the building. I loved art in my kitchen though, we all did it. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do a lot of fun art projects. <laughs> Um, do you have a question? Go ahead. I have a question regarding programming. Um, as, again, we're going into budget season. Are you anticipating we're going to have to change, advance, lengthen any of our programming, given that we're expecting a wider variation in ability of our students, as some are going to come in very behind, some are going to come in advanced, whereas in prior years it's been a little bit more cohesive? Is that something that, that are in the works that you're planning on, or it's really kind of not on the radar right now? No, we have two things in the works. So this summer we did our Summer Learning Academy, which was six weeks versus the four weeks that it typically is. Um, we invited about 120 students. We averaged about 50 to 60 a day. Um, I think when we rolled out the Summer Learning Academy in February of last year, there were a lot more families that wanted their children to attend, and then everybody was exhausted by June, and they were like, let's just have a summer at the beach, and understandably so. So the number of people that were invited was, we had about half every day, which is I mean, still great, um, but the feedback on that experience was awesome. Um, and so I see us during budgetary season thinking about that for next summer. Um, additionally, on Monday, I met with our new grant coordinator, Karen Burke. Thank Burke. Berg, sorry, sorry, Karen. <laughs> Karen Berg, um, and we talked about ESSER three funds and how we might be able to use those to um, for Can you those students, that is just for those who don't know what those funds are. Um, so, ESSER three funds are funds from the federal government that are intended to support um, education of our students, whether that's social emotional learning or academic students, um, in response to COVID. Um, so, that's a brief, probably a lot more to it, but that's the gist. Um, so, we actually talked about um, potentially using some of those funds for before or after school tutoring for some of our students that may qualify. So we'll use our fall benchmarks, which we do every year at the end of September, beginning of October, on all of our students. Um, and that data will come in and we'll use that to decide which students qualify for any intervention at all or how much they qualify for. And then we have those funds to do that um, and they expire in 2024. Um, but I imagine if that data comes back and it shows us something that's more startling than those funds could support, I would be bringing that to the board and putting that through the budget operating budget. So is that that fund pool you're talking about, is that the 59,000 we just approved? Correct. Okay. That we just got? And Correct. Okay. Agreed to expend? Okay. Um, I had one more question. How many kindergartners you got this year? Oh, I love that you just asked me that. So what I can tell you, I don't know the next, I'm close to 80, so we have five classes and they're all at 17 or 18. How's that? Awesome. So more than 85. <laughs> we broke the threshold on a couple classes. Unexpectedly. You did go over. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. But I have no space for a sixth teacher, so oh well. <laughs> We're going to make it work. We have partnership models that are fantastic, and it's going to be amazing. What's a partnership model? So we always have kindergarten aides in the classroom. So you have your teacher and your partnership. And we did a lot of work this spring on um, the intentionality of those partnerships and what they both bring to the classroom in terms of their strengths and how they can um, really balance each other out and have the right eyes on those students to be able to provide the right services. Um, some of those ESPs, for example, um, have backgrounds in speech, and so it's great that they could be in a classroom where they might be able to provide some of that tier two early intervention for some of our children um, or OT experience. So we're really thoughtful about those so that we can support the kids in those classes. Okay, I think, uh, is that it? You have anything else? Any Unless more questions, questions from the board? Shall we move on? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to public input. If I can find my. Um, they should have the list. Of it. There it is. It's all right. Don't worry. Um, the next thing on our agenda is public input from visitors. 
Um, just want to go over the guidelines. Um, everyone gets to speak once. Who has signed up? I have eight people on sheet one. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So 13 people in total we'll be hearing from. Everybody gets three minutes. Um, we will be timing. I don't want to give people the hook, so please get to your point quickly so I don't have to give you the hook. Um, of course, keep it respectful uh, and dignified. And we will collect your questions if we can. At the end, we'll have that summary of questions. If we can, like, tick off the quick ones, um, we'll do that. If we can't, then we'll have to come back uh, with answers um, ap after the fact, okay? So with that, we have a microphone here. I don't know, is, is, Tim, is this one on in front? That one's on? Okay. Uh, the first Stratum resident is James Bolton of One Rollins Farm. I don't know, do I need to read out their address for the minutes or can we just use this? Um, for the minutes would be helpful. Okay. Hi, Janice. Hi, thank you. Um, do I need a timer? Sorry, I barely edited what I was gonna say because of already hearing the proposal, which is great. I was gonna say thank you all for <laughs> adjusting the way that it was done after seeing how the co-op went it went so much smoother tonight yeah trying to figure out how to make that good sorry can we increase the talk? volume on the mic i think i hear somebody yeah can you hear me now um anyway and i also want to say thank you to the board members who responded to the various emails that i sent because i know i sent y'all like i don't know 15 or something and y'all sent me some very personalized responses which i very much appreciated uh it was nice the interaction was very nice um as far as what I was going to say, um, for my family, we've been opposed to the continued use of masks, you know, with regard to COVID in the schools and many other settings. Um, two of my kids have speech issues that their impact, not just to their ability to overcome their speech issues in the last year, but their self-confidence when on a Zoom call, um, my son knows what he's saying. He's saying, or I can hear what he's saying. But even the person on the other side of the thing, they're just like, oh, okay, and they move on. Because you can't sit there and hold up and try and figure out that he's saying computer, but you can't understand it. And so he knows that, and you can see it in his eyes and how it impacts him. And so then he doesn't want to be seen on the camera. He doesn't want to talk in class. It impacts him emotionally. And then when I see the school district talking about, well, we care about their social, emotional stuff, and I see that, and I'm like, it's hard for me to see how he's cared for in that regard. Um, and then uh, other things is, I wanna say, please, I, I, I like Cheryl's idea of having a, a committee to look at a matrix and how to go forward. Look at what other school districts are doing. Um, your idea about surveying the people, uh, New Market, that's exactly what they did. They put all of that into their committee thing. It was great, you could see it all, it's very transparent. And that's what I would ask of our own board, is do something like that where we can see what drove your decision. Um, the other thing is the guidelines, as if they're anything like the full guidelines that the co-op got, they were very vague in so many places. It says, you know, community this or that, but if you go to the dashboard and you look on there, you see there's uh, public health region, there's county, there's cities, there's different areas and it's not clear what community means and so everybody's going to look at that and go, I don't know, I see this for public health region, but I see this for Rockingham County, but Rockingham County includes Salem and Salem's very different than Stratum. Um, so those are things that I think that need to be taken into account. Um, and I would also urge using a regular review of the guidelines that are taken into place. You know, make it a, once a month, get together, have a committee that says, hey, here's, what, here's the trends, here's the latest things we know, do we want to adjust our guidelines? Don't just sit there and say, this is the thing for the next nine months, you deal with it. It's not very good for the community or for the kids, I think. Um, and that's all I had to say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Julie Lacasse of 10 Tall Pines. Hi, Julie. I just also want to say thank you. I reached out to everybody and I got a response from almost everybody, so I really appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate a lot of what you all said and I agree with most of it. Um, as you know, children's bodies require oxygen to thrive and grow. We don't know how, long, how, how this mask wearing is going to affect the children long term. And it's not a child's job to keep the adults safe. If administrators want to wear a mask, that's great. 
And if they don't, that should be great too. You can be in favor of something, but be opposed to it being mandatory. Regarding our children, the parents need to decide what's best for them with a mask optional school year. And we can do better than this matrix here, I agree with you, Cheryl. Let's set our own standards and stratum. Let's stop living in and promoting fear. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Next we have David Kisver. I hope I didn't wreck that name. Sorry, I did. Okay. Hey, uh, well, hello, good evening, everyone. Um, had so much you want to say, but <clears throat> I'll be honest, you kind of blew me away with your, uh, your original kind of thoughts on what you wanted to do this year. Uh, I really didn't expect that, to be honest with you. I was expecting quite the opposite. Um, and I do appreciate you recognizing the fact that in our state, you know, no uh, young children have died with a COVID uh, test, a positive COVID test. No teenagers have died. You could go further. There's no 20 year olds, no 30 year olds, no 40 year olds. We have to get just about to mid 50s before we see anybody who's passed away from COVID. And these were not healthy people, because you can look it up right on the CDC. These were sick people that had severe underlying conditions, um, which, you know, if you bothered to look, you would see that this is not an eminent public threat to everybody. Um, secondly, out of any of you up there, and I'm just curious, uh, would you all agree these N95 masks are good? Call them, say, gold standard, perhaps? Do any of you have any idea what that N95 stands for? Isn't it particle size? It is, to a hmm. degree. Yeah, it's 95% filter capability at 0.3 microns. 0.3 microns. That's pretty small. Mm -hmm. okay, it says it right on the box. It also says we don't work so well at 0.3 microns, but it, it is effective. <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 is 0.1 micron. Now, you don't have to be I a genius. I don't know what a micron is. Yeah, I, I figured we'd kind of get to that. A micron is a measurement. Uh, okay. Look at it as a micrometer. I believe it's one million, one million of them make up a meter. So they're pretty small, right? So 0.3, that's, that's the holes in these masks. What we're trying to prevent from leaving is 0.1. So, you know, don't get me wrong, the masks will prevent, you know, snot and, you know, all sorts of, you know, fluid from coming out. But it's not gonna, come, it's not gonna protect an aerosolized, you know, organism. Uh, it's just not. I'm not against masks for any reason other than they just are not doing what you think they're doing. There wouldn't be the millions of, quote, cases if they were doing what they were doing. And those millions of cases mean nothing anyway. Um, I'm the vice president of a COVID testing lab. I've been selling molecular diagnostic equipment for 15 years. I'm no I expert in microbiology or virology, but I know enough to know how ridiculous and overblown this has been. Um, I don't know when you guys hear of a case. I'm not sure what you think. I don't know if you think, is that someone like sick? Is that someone dying? I, I don't know. I, I have a feeling most people do have that feeling, um, but it's not. It's nothing more than a COVID, a, a positive test for SARS-CoV-2, which means absolutely nothing. What matters is when someone is sick, okay? My happy time. Close enough. So my point is, I'm not <laughs> trying to, please. sorry. Yeah. So my, my point is, no, do, I can't some, turn it off. do some research, take a look. If you're gonna make these decisions for everyone, just look it up. I mean, it's not rocket science. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. okay, next we have uh, Tim Roach of Two Chelsea Way. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? I'm yep. wearing one of those crazy masks. Um, I have two kids home with COVID. Now, every indication is they caught it in this building. They were masked, to the gentleman's point. I open with this comment, though, to speak in support of you got to look at this from an air quality perspective. It's aerosolized, as the previous speaker mentioned. I appreciate his knowledge on that subject. Masks, whether they're, they're not 100% effective. They're not going to save you from every case. They're not going to prevent 
spread completely, but it's source control in an air quality problem. I worked as an air quality meteorologist for some years. We put buffers on coal plants. We put catalytic converters in cars. That's what this is. It's not perfect, but it's the best we got with a bunch of kids that don't have any other option. So we, we go to Great Lanes to protect the vulnerable. I don't send my kid to school with peanut butter. Why? Because there might be somebody that's vulnerable to that. Every single kid in here is vulnerable. What I witnessed, now my kids aren't dying, but the shakes, the fever, you know, the, the loss of smell, it's not good. And I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. I think they're gonna be fine. They seem fine now. We'll move on, you know, we'll be okay. Um, my last comment though was with some of your remarks up here earlier. Based on my experience with, from being, these kids being exposed, to being notified they were exposed, to testing, to getting that result, which took forever, you're not gonna be able to pivot and have a quick meeting and change your approach. Cat will be out of the bag. So I appreciate what Dr. Ryan did here. I think this is reasonable. And I hope you'll consider these remarks in your group. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Lindsay Watson of 17 Tall Pines Drive. Tall Pines turned out tonight. <laughs> I am brand new to the community, so very happy to be here. I appreciate you ladies and coming to orientation, and I'm really just thrilled to have my daughter, Reese. She'll be going into first grade. We came from Portsmouth, so she did do kindergarten at Dondero um, last year, and it's like hard to be here. It's so nerve wracking and I appreciate, you know, and I value what each of you are saying. I value what everyone who came here to stand up and say something. And, you know, if it were left to me, I would love for masks to be optional because Reese did get to go in school and she did wear it every day. That being said, she was a champ. She was pleasant, she was happy, she was thrilled to be there. And that doesn't speak for every child and every family, but, I would respect someone who wanted to wear a mask and I would respect someone who didn't want to wear a mask. So I guess that leaves me just kind of in the middle of it, which is where I often find myself. But I did appreciate what Cheryl said and I appreciated what you said, Carissa. And I think that at the core of our value, whether you're five, six, 60 or 75, everyone wants to feel heard and wants to hear feel valued and doing something like a survey, there's still always gonna be people that are on one side or the other or aren't satisfied with it. But, you know, I came here tonight and hadn't really planned to, and so I appreciate the opportunity to be here, but for the people that couldn't make it here, um, you know, my vote would for it to be optional, but I don't see any harm in doing a survey as well to like, to have people feel seen and heard. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Welcome you. to our community. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next, we have Megan Parrish of 54 Bunker Hill. Hi, uh, Megan Parrish, uh, Stratum Mom. Uh, I guess I, I had something prepared to say, but I really appreciate um, and was uh, kind of shocked to hear what you had to say. And uh, I love the idea of doing a survey, and um, you know, I, I do think it, the numbers would need to be higher in order for the children to be masked. And um, I love the idea of uh, revisiting that uh, at a later date. Um, you know, because uh, like you as well, I, I think of kids with special needs. You know, s speech impediments, hearing impaired, uh, special needs kids that need to be able to read facial expressions, um, all children need to be able to read facial expressions. Uh, and it's really time for them to stop living in fear. And I really think that a mask is exactly that. This is a symbol of fear and it's a symbol of sickness. And um, it's time for them to have a real childhood, you know, and uh, sick until proven healthy is not 
a way for them to live. Um, so uh, thank you very much, and um, for masks optional. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Peter Lessards. Lessards or Lessards? Lessards. Okay, thank you. Of Three Oak Lane. what you talked about on your the, to the board chair on, on confusion uh, I agree with pretty much everything you say except there was one sentence that I probably disagree with a small thing which is you said New Hampshire Department of Health and the CDC one of the confusing things for parents I think well uh, is that if you look at something like the New York Times we're not red okay that's weird you would think the New York Times follows the CDC New York Times does follow the CDC in order to be read for the CDC, you have to have 100 cases in a cumulative seven days. New Hampshire chose for reasons that have, people have asked, we haven't heard a reason, to make it 14. So when it's cumulative, and it's 14, we are twice as sensitive. It's why you don't feel like, it, we're red. I don't see a lot of people in terror, but you know, I think the, I think the, the CDC's guidelines are a little bit too loose. We put you red too quickly. But we are twice as sensitive. That's why go to NewYorkTimes.com, look at the map. You will see a lot of red in Arkansas. Please, guys, get vaccinated down there. Cut it out. But we're yellow here, and we're yellow because we. Yeah, I'm mean, sorry. We're yellow on the New York Times because in seven days we have fewer than 100 cases. But when you make it 14 days and it's cumulative, that t makes us red. So our whole red map is because of that change. So when you say CDC and New Hampshire. It's a little difficult because they're different. We, uh, and we have asked, nobody has said why. Um, and so, and as far as, you know, people who used to say this is like the flu would drive me nuts because COVID was like the flu if we had never seen the flu before. I mean, COVID was dangerous. It was dangerous to a lot of people. And it drove me nuts to hear people say, like, it was. It was very dangerous. Like, this was not, but. Anybody who thinks that this is more dangerous for kids than the flu, that's not what the data says at all. And has not said that for a long time. You know, I actually didn't come in on this because I think it's hard when, it, like, until now, because it's been hard to know, but we have enough data now. It is less dangerous than the flu. And one of my concerns is if you can mask at this level of, of danger, you can mask every winter. And really, you should. I mean, if this is the level that triggers it, it means the board has the right to mask every winter, which is, which is an extraordinary thing. And I've said this to people who are pro-mask and they've said, yeah. I'm like, okay, that wasn't my point. My point was not, yeah. So um, I, really, I, I really like the idea of op uh, mass optional. I'm not even a big fan of the numbers. And I have to say on the grid, so many people left. <laughs> Look, the grid could be two things. If we're red, masks are mandatory. If we're not, masks are optional. That whole grid is what that is. It doesn't matter vaccination rate. That doesn't change that, what I just said. Nothing on that grid changes. If we're red, masks are mandatory on that chart. If we're not, masks are optional. And that would be, that's a much easier thing to say, and that is the truth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. tone to end on. You know, I, you're gonna laugh at me, but I, I didn't, and when I do this, it, it like resets, and then I can't do it again. I use this at work, too, <laughs> for the agenda, because people don't feel offended when they hear that little. It is not um, offensive. There's some others that are a little harsher. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Next, we have Lisa Pond of 37 River Road. Um, I'm also a new family to Stratum. Um, we chose not to do kindergarten last year just because it wasn't going to work for us because I was pregnant and we had a two-year-old. So kindergarten or on Zoom, not going to happen. Um, but I'll keep this short and sweet. I'm just in favor of mass optional. Um, I think that would be better for the kids. Um, and I just don't think they need to live thinking that they're sick all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's page one. Now we have Brad Doubt Doubting. Yeah. That's right, we've heard from you before. Hi, Brad. Uh, yeah. Good, how are you? Great. Uh, Kate, that was phenomenal information. So I've been looking at information like that since day one, right? Because it's all about assessing risk. How we all assess risk. Like, look at all of our board members right now. All of our board members are sitting shoulder to shoulder. 
Now, there could be a likelihood that one of them has COVID and is asymptomatic. But you are all okay with that acceptable risk level, okay? My risk level for my kids in them catching COVID and them getting sick is very low. I, 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 have, I have no concern with them getting COVID and then getting healthy because of the acceptable risk level. And Kate, you had all those numbers. Flu for school age kids, currently on the CDC site, yes, is more dangerous than COVID. If you take that a step further and look at pneumonia, pneumonia deaths are about 1,000. COVID deaths for school age kids, zero to 17, the exact number is about 400. You take that a step further, I hear a lot about flu, pneumonia deaths compared to COVID. You take that a step further to sepsis, okay? Bacterial or viral. My son had sepsis and almost died. He was in the children's hospital for seven days, okay? 7,000 kids, school age kids die of sepsis every year. We, we don't hear about that, right? So again, it's about assessing risk. It's about parents assessing, assessing risk for their children. And I beg you, Ford, to give us parents the power to make those decisions for our children. And Cheryl, that was very heartfelt. I, I, I felt that speech. Chris, thank you. Kate, again, thank you for pulling those numbers. It's a lot of work pulling those numbers from CDC and looking at those charts. And again, I thank you very much for doing that. Thank you, thank you Brad. Okay, we have, let me do my timer here. We have, oh, Margo or Margaret? Margaret. Margaret Drahenj. Oh, you're going to have to help me with the last name. Just say D. I need your last name. How did you say that? Okay, that's in the recording. Good, and you're at four Hickory <laughs> Pond. Great, thank you. I didn't get that right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Nobody can get mine either, so that's I, I don't take offense. I hope you don't. Sorry. Um, so I'll be quick. I took notes. My goal is not to sway anyone tonight, right? Like clearly, tell what came out on, right? I'm one of the few ones wearing a mask. Um, I first of all want to thank the school board. It is not an easy job. It is not a some people not even pay job, so I appreciate it. I also appreciate everyone being here tonight. I think it's cool we're all here for the same reason as to what we believe is best for our kids, right? And I think when there's actually more things we have in common than we have differently, we all want the best for every child here, which I think is a pretty cool thing, actually. Um, that being said, is this is a very evolving situation that no one's in, no one in this room is an expert on, right? We can all quote facts, we can all say things, we can talk to one clinician. That's fine. That's one clinician. The Delta variant is um, something that's unique, dynamic, sucks, right? I mean, I don't think anyone loves wearing a mask, myself included, right? I'm hot, like shoot. I don't want my kids to wear a mask for forever either, right? So what I just ask, and my whole reason I want to talk, is that we all shared a lot of personal opinions, and when it comes to our kids, our opinions matter. But when we're talking about the school board, I ask that you continue to look at the facts and the data. I think a survey is actually a great idea because I think people want to be valued, they want to be heard, but just because our opinion, that could be mine too, isn't the one that's ultimately decided. I know at the end, it wasn't because you didn't hear me. That we have to, it's a fine balancing act. I, can, I thank you for looking at the data and for making the best decision, whatever that is. And you know, I still haven't made up my decision yet, right? Because you, you want the best for your kids and you want the best, I want the best for all of your kids too, right? That it means social, emotional, physical, spiritual, all the above, I don't know. But thank you for using the facts, thank you for using the data, and thank you for um, creating an environment that co parents feel comfortable sharing their opinions and feeling heard. So thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Stephanie Dobbins, 8 Boat Club Drive. And please correct me if I didn't get that right. Is it Dobbins? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's a little hard, I think, to follow up because Margot said everything that I was probably going to say, and she was very eloquent when she said it. Um, but thank you all for being so thoughtful and you know sharing your data and, and um, really looking into this. I think what I just want to talk about personally, um, just some personal anecdotes, I'm a nurse at Boston Children's Hospital. I work on the cardiology floor. My job never changed during COVID. 
we were jammed. We were jammed packed with our regular cardiac kids, kids waiting for hearts, kids living with us waiting for hearts, kids who got COVID and started to have cardiac issues as a result. Is it everybody? Was it the whole floor? No. But there was somebody who was citing, uh, uh, I can't remember who amongst you was citing some data and had said something like, you know, the number of kids who had, you know, who have, or people have died, you know, 0.03%, you know, whatever. No, that's not whatever. Those are people. I know kids who have died from COVID. I personally have a patient I have taken care of who has cardiac arrested and is less than a year old and is dying in the cardiac ICU at my hospital. And so is that all of our children? Is that all of our kids who go to Strata Memorial? No, but why didn't you say that to that kid's parents' faces? Because no matter what your statistics and your numbers are, these are real people we're talking about. And again, does, do the few kids that I have seen with my eyes who have died from the flu, who have been taken off transplant lists because they've gotten the flu and are no longer eligible and have died? Does that dictate what all of our children and what all of the students have to do? No, these are not regular, normal occurrences, but these are people we're talking about and I love you, Dave, I love you so much, but I would go to battle with my N95. Those work, they work like a boss. I have had kids spurt God knows what into my face, <laughs> particles, and this has been pre-COVID and during COVID, and I have not once gotten sick, and I have not seen one kid die of the flu. So N95, work. they work. So I just want to say, again, because of what I do for my job, and last year I was diagnosed with cancer, and so in the middle of quarantine, I was going through radiation, and I went through surgery, so I myself was immunocompromised, and still returned to work with, I, I just want to say that I take care, my, my family knows how to wear masks and I know how to wear masks. Those are the choices that we make to keep other people safe. And I think if it's just the way that if you talk about masks being scary and if you don't wash your hands, you're gonna kill someone. Yeah, that makes it scary for your kids how you talk about it. But there's masks for a whole lot of kids out there that mean freedom for them. It means that they have a heart transplant and they can now go outside safely that they have cystic fibrosis and they can now go to the garden at my hospital. So masks are not always scary, but how you talk about them is. Thank you. So, uh, we're not doing questions and response. I just want to, can we take just 15 seconds for a moment of silence for that kiddo who's in the hospital, who's really having a hard time with COVID and everything else we can just send 10 seconds of positive energy at this meeting. Now, can I say no? I would appreciate okay. it. Um, no, we can take 15 seconds, please. I mean, I'll take as long as you want, but just in honor of every kid who, who has COVID, and it's not to discount COVID by any means in this discussion. So I'm gonna be quiet now and respect that 10 seconds. Thank you. So we have two more speakers. We have Drew Pierce, it looks like, of 16 Stephen Drive, I believe that's Drive. Hi, Drew. Hi, thank you. I had to write my notes down because I'm not really good at public speaking. It's my first time. No props to that's you for okay. being here. Nobody's good at it, that's right. okay. So I learned how to play, almost play basketball in this gym and <laughs> climb that rope there. So it's in this place. It's a little different being at this side. <laughs> Welcome back. Again, I appreciate your time tonight to hear the concern of all the citizens, all the parents that are in here. I know it's a hard job to do sitting on a board. I sit on a different board, and that's just as difficult, making decisions for your neighbors. Um, my whole family had COVID. Um, so according to that matrix, the four of us, if just one more of us had it, would have put us in that red level. 
So my family plus one more person in town equals mask for everybody. That seems like a very small number. Uh, my family all survived. Obviously, I'm happy about that. I um, know a lot of people have not been so lucky. Or, um, but the general numbers are that, especially children, are not dying from this. And it's hard to follow what just happened with just the previous speaker. I'm not discounting that. People have died from this. But most people do not die from this. My son Julian's coming to kindergarten this year. Um, COVID's not going to kill him any more than lightning or be eaten by a shark. Data supports that. Uh, masks should be up to the parents, just like vaccinations. Um, we should not need to come to a school board meeting on a Wednesday night instead of having dinner with our family to beg to be able to send our kids to school without masks. It should be up to the parents to make that decision at home. Uh, it seems from what we have here that a strong majority of the speakers here are in favor of the mask being optional. Uh, I think surveys are a great idea, but they are corruptible. Parents, again, should have the choice, period. They are our kids, not the school boards, not the schools. We're responsible for what happens to their health later in life. We're responsible for their mental well-being um, throughout their life unless they become adults. I mean, one thing I'm just going to say is, I know there were a few speakers against having the mask being required. One of them just said he had two kids at home with COVID. Why is he even here if he's so worried about it? Somebody should look into that. Why did he expose us all tonight if he's so worried about this? And that's the end of what I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. So lastly, we have Rachel. I saw you come in. Rachel Jefferson, 8 Fifield Lane. I believe that's Lane. Hi there. So I'll speak to the last speaker. So Tim was here because he's a vaccinated person that you don't have to quarantine if a household member has COVID. And I know this because my kid had COVID just like Tim's kid had COVID, possibly from the Stratum rec camp because that's where he was during the week that he got COVID. And so I think masks should be um, guided by the matrix that Dr. Ryan and the um, superintendent's office put together. I think that right now, you know, there's a lot of unknown with del uh, the Delta variant and cases obviously are skyrocketing around us. Um, my concern is that my kid just had to miss overnight camp. He had to miss a football tournament. He had to miss his grandparents' retirement party. His grandparents didn't fly up. So if he gets COVID again this school year, he's going to have to miss sports, school for 10 days. And I don't know about your kids, but my kids cannot afford to miss any more school. They've lost a lot of time these last couple of years. And I think something that's also important for us to know a little bit more about is what's the guidelines with the nurse department. So if your kid has a sniffle, can they come to school if we're not wearing masks? We're just gonna, are we gonna spread all the germs again and have more cases? I mean, maybe Nurse Lily needs to speak as to what the protocol is gonna be um, come the school year for, symptoms because obviously we know that COVID masks a lot of other um, symptoms. I, for one, didn't realize that my own kid had COVID because the cases at that time in Stratum were low. And since that time, they've gone up and there were five cases at the Stratum rec camp that week. So um, I would like to know the school's position on um, what the guidelines are for students with any sort of symptoms. So we're talking allergy symptoms, sniffly nose, itchy eyes, a cough, what is the school going to do if we're not wearing masks and those kids have symptoms? Are they allowed to come? Because that obviously complicates issues for families if they can't send their kids to school for any little thing because we're not masking, which is a simple solution. And I get that parents want to make their own decision for their kids, but you're sending them to a community school where there's a lot of students and it's pretty selfish that we could negate all of these issues if we just wore masks. My kids have been wearing them for a year and a half. They haven't complained once. My kid was wearing a mask for 10 days in our house because no one else tested positive. And it was not a big deal. He was happy to wear his mask and keep us all safe. And I just haven't heard complaints from other children. So if they're getting it at home because the parents are complaining all the time, it's gonna translate to the child. But for the most part, kids that I've talked to, it's a non-issue. And I really hope that you consider um, the whole entirety of you know the decisions that you make tonight and not listen to just the loud parents that you know are anti-mask so thank you thanks rachel rachel that is a really good question so mm -hmm. thank you for bringing that up what do 
we have any answers to that? Um, not yet, actually. Okay. That was on my list of. We, Sorry, we do. Do you want to answer that, Chair? Uh, yeah, I was just think looking back through my notes. I don't. Th I think that was the only question that was posed. Um, and if we have an answer, I'd rather dispense it now and not have to come back to it. Sure. The uh, recommendation, and, and I know the nurses. I'm looking at Nurse Lily back there. Has been, and they attend. I think it's once a week. You attend a, a meeting, or is it every? Yes. So the recommendation is, if your child has any symptoms, that keep them home. So I have. A I'm sorry, Lily. What? That yeah. would be the chair's call. Can she? If you'd like to, yeah. Let's let's elaborate. Um, I'm Nurse Lilly. Um, I feel like I have, um, you know, done a lot in um, this past year. Uh, done yes, a I. <laughs> uh, right now, um, Dr. Chan will be uh, Dr. Daly, Dr. Chan, Dr. Talbot, um, our head of the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. Um, will be speaking to us once a month, unless it needs to be more often. I've listened to him twice. Um, there is a. Uh, toolkit for schools um, and our matrix that Dr. Ryan has come up with is awesome. Um, I would highly recommend the board use it. If um, your child has a headache, a stomach ache, nausea, vomiting, um, the sniffles, um, I will have to exclude and test you know, I will have to send that child home and they will have to be tested and have a negative COVID test before they can return to school. Is that, late? Yeah, is that law? It is uh, the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services um, recommendations and that is also the SAU recommendations at this time. So, it is the protocol. So just hang on there. Um, oh, uh, me too. <laughs> um, so uh, the question I have is very similar to yours. Um, if it's SAU recommendation, does that give the board authority to modify it, Esther? The board can absolutely modify it. I'm not clear as to health protocols and nurses in that. That's not, I'm not well versed in that. So I would defer to Dr. Ryan or Nurse Lilly. I know that as far as our recommendation as a whole plan, the board absolutely has the final say on that. But I don't know if, if the nurses' rules are governed by a different set of circumstances. I do have a licensing board that I do have to, um, you know, continue to keep my license. So if I ever felt like I was going to be you know, at a point where I could get in trouble or lose my license, then, you know, I do have a different governing board, well, yes. Absolutely have a code of ethics, it's just a matter of absolutely. will that code of ethics be infringed upon um, and whether a recommendation is just that, a recommendation. Um, so that's something that we can Yes, that and I will obviously defer that to Esther and David in terms of the, you know, but it is um, very mild symptoms will be excluded in test. Can I ask a question while you're there? How often, I mean, we've been through this a year, right? Mm -hmm. How often were those symptoms actually an infection, of co a COVID infection? I don't year? have that data. Like, I mean, just off the top of your head, the though, top was it, of my head, was honestly. It? We had uh, varying times, obviously. I think you guys heard of the cases that we had right. COVID. Um, I have a spreadsheet that has every time I, you know, you know would test a, an individual, um, depending on the month. Um, we would have up to over 100 people, you know, be excluded and tested. Oh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the other thing, too. We didn't see as many colds, flu, because I think the masks were protecting the students from getting things like the, sni you know, the sniffles and colds and things like that. So we didn't see any flu cases in our school last year. Okay, come on, come on. We need to keep order in the meeting. We need to keep order in the meeting, okay? We've, we've closed the public input session, now this board meeting, okay? Um, and we're asking Ursula Lee to give her opinion, right? Um, and I just wanna make sure we continue in that vein. Um, I 
If Kate has a question. Go ahead. I had I lost my train of thought, but you go ahead. Um, is that come back to me. requiring a PCR test or a rapid? Um, at this point, a rapid test is, you know, what is it, it actually really is the recommendation of the doctor. Um, I can't tell you what the oh, recommendation really? is. Yes. So, so know you know, I'll know. accept a rapid test if that's what the doctor has recommended. If a parent chooses to go to CVS and get that test done, that you know, that test will be um, be okay. At this time. Our district has not um, decided on home testing kits. Uh, that was going to be a question I had for the next nurses meeting. I don't even know if this is a good idea. I'm just throwing it out there because I know other schools are doing it. Can our school secure a bunch of rapid tests? And if parents are okay with them getting rapid tests, have you administer it and then they can just go back to class if it's negative? We had worked on a protocol for that. I believe you guys had heard about that last year. Um, again, that would be up to the district to decide if they want to implement that. At this time, um, CLIO certified schools are able to administer the Binax next now card. I'm just thinking it would keep kids in school and not disrupt if, if they were negative, you know? It could, yes. Cheryl, to, to your point, what you said about like how many kids showed symptoms, I have a seven and an eight year old. I got the second one tested because the first one had a symptom, the second one didn't. So, I mean, if you want to take my little family, that's 50%. I mean, and you were amazing and a lifesaver, and I love you. So I just want to throw that out there that I value what you have to say, and I value everything you do because Saturday and Sunday you were on the phone with me, and I can't say that many people would take that time and the effort. Thank you. That wasn't really where I was going with that question, actually. Um, Let me. Think we have it. That's all right. You can thank. You can always thank Darcy. Like, um, I was thinking, um, you know, the protocol we have for the office where I work. Um, it's there's a caveat of symptoms that can't be explained by something else that is normal for you. Like, I get allergies. So oh, every time I get yeah. allergies, and I, that's why I wanted to ask, do we have that as a caveat so that kids who have allergies are not being sent home <laughs> and tested? So yes, I should have began with that. It's any new or unexplained symptoms. Okay. So um, the only problem with that is that a lot of times we don't have it documented that the child actually has seasonal allergies. And so it, I will let the parent know that if they can get a doctor's note to say that their child is having seasonal allergies and not COVID, then I'm more than happy to accept that. Um, I've yet to find a doctor who will actually not do a test and just write the note. If you have them there, yeah, okay. Um, can, we, uh, can we have another, do, should we have another discussion about rapid testing for, for stratum? Does that make sense? I know you're not prepared for that, but is that even an option? Yeah. Again, if the board at this time in the recommendations, it's not being presented as a recommendation, but the board could certainly look into that, ask me to look into it and okay. come back. Okay. I just want to make a comment on should whatever, I mean, should we choose not to wear masks? It is a heavy accountability on our parents to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. yes. And I really want to make that clear in this discussion and I'm thinking about it and we're putting, should we choose that and when we vote on it, that is a lot of trust and I think respect from one another and accepting risk as you had said and all of that and not sending your kid to school with symptoms and respecting all of that and I think that is a level of trust and, and I, I hear your apprehension back there when you're saying, look like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be careful and, and, and I need everyone else to by wearing a mask and by not, we're saying, if you do have the sniffles, please don't come. Because honestly, as a parent, I'm going to be ticked if my kid's home and your kid's going to school with the sniffles. Well, so I just really want to acknowledge that and make sure that everyone here makes sure that they know that and they spread that regardless of what decision we make. Don't send your kids to school sick because it just makes all of our jobs harder. Okay, thank you, Nurse Lily. You're welcome. I uh, appreciate it. Um, okay. We heard from Kate, we heard from the ad administration, we heard from the public. Um, we need to figure out how we want to move forward. So. I'd like to make a motion for parents to have masks optional. For how long? Till our next board meeting. I think my opinion is this. This is gray area, we need to think in the gray, we need to be creative. You're right, when sniffle season comes, my, what's been driving my mind is our kids need education. 
they need to move forward. They need contact time with their teachers. Part of education is seeing faces. And if we can give them that, that for a, a week, a month, I'm a speech pathologist. I'll tell you, kids seeing each other's facial expressions and reading someone for a day is huge. If we can give them that for a short period of time, then I want to make masks optional until we reconvene next month. Okay, so the motion is mask optional till the next board meeting, which is September 18th. I think we should be when we will revisit. Okay. I think we should revisit this at every meeting and should yeah, things. Well, wait a second. We have to be careful about that. But let's okay. get to discussion. All right. So that was the motion. Do we have a second on that motion? So Kate okay. seconding the motion. Now we can have the discussion. Okay. Um, Aaron, I believe masks are going to keep us in school. We all agree. This is the third school year that our kids are dealing with COVID. This, this is the way to keep our kids in school. This is what we need to do. We need to think about our community that we need to keep our kids going to school every single day. We cannot afford to have to close groups of kids because there's an outbreak, close schools, close grades, close recess pods or lunch pods, masks. They're terrible. Nobody wants to be wearing them. I agree with the CDC. I agree with the AAP. I am not a physician. I am not a researcher. I am on the board and I'm trying to keep kids in our buildings. Any other comments? Sarah, did you have your hand up? No. Um, I, I, what I wanted to say when I cut you off was um, we need to give our administration um, a, a guideline on how to operate the school. So revisiting it every month doesn't help them run the school district, yeah. right? Yeah. They They're need to be able to pull right. the trigger. So absolutely right. I, I don't disagree. I mean, I agree with the idea of opening the schools, mask optional, although I would use different words, not requiring masks. I don't well, like whatever, mask optional, whatever. Is. I don't like those words. But anyway, but, um, but we do need to work on uh, a matrix or a decision tree or whatever that's going to be so that our team can operate the schools. So could we do a subcommittee? What, well, do we need a subcommittee or do we need another meeting? I mean, we can have a meeting. We can have a work session, workshop, right? Can we do a work, we can figure that out with Esther, okay? Um, and we could also do it sooner rather than later. We don't need to wait till September, um, but I think we, it would be good to let parents know this is how we're going to open the school this year. Um, the other thing I was going to add is I do like your idea of polling parents. I don't. I. I you know how I feel about, I know. you know, let it, you know, making it a jump ball for everybody when it comes to safety. But I think it would be good to at least know where people are on this issue. Um, but I don't want 13% of parents responding. I want 99% of parents. Well, maybe you'll get 99 because they're interested in the issue. Well, I'm saying that out loud so everyone tells everybody, and then all, okay. the, all the other parents. Fill so can too. we? We can't do that till school opens, right? We can't do that kind of a poll. Yes, I am. Sorry. I'm looking at you, Kate. Sorry. All right. So I would like, I kind of know where they are because of all the email we've been getting, but I don't think it hurts to um, ask the question, but I think we do need to make the decision first on what we want to do. I'm just saying that to you. I, I'm not telling you. I'm just, you're in my line of sight. So, okay. Any more discussion? Are we ready to vote? There, there was, uh, Cheryl just had asked for a second. I got a second. I got a second oh, from uh, Kate. Oh, I didn't hear you. Sorry. Sorry. So we've got the motion, we've got the second, and we had the discussion. All right. If there any more discussion, how do we want to vote? Who wants to go first? Who uh, just... Wait. Sorry. Ah, so Sarah. I knew she was going to say. I knew you had something to say. <laughs> Hard to stay quiet. Um, I, the reason why I'm speaking up is only because I don't know if I would agree with that motion to just wait the month. That doesn't make sense to me. So, why? <laughs> say more. Um, I would like to be able to have the workshop, create the matrix, and then have a board meeting even prior to that so we know which way to go. That's great. And then we're, we're not living month to month. Can you tell before school starts? Yeah. Wait. Uh, we can't do a workshop yeah, before school and have another board meeting before school starts. I mean, that's, that's well, too tight. Okay. But I what? would let's like to get let's get a decision. Yeah, let's yeah. get it going. Let's do a workshop tonight after this. Yeah, I, I, we don't need to post for a workshop, right? I we, I'm sorry, we can't, I can't do a workshop tonight. We've got non-publics. Yeah. We've got we got a lot to do tonight. So, 
But to Aaron's point, we can we can do it quickly. Yeah. We can make a matrix quickly. I don't know if we can make a matrix I can't quickly. Make a matrix quickly. I mean, I made one, but I don't know if it's any good. Um, <laughs> so what I hear you saying is we need to expedite the process. A month is too long, right? Mm -hmm. So why? Month too long. Yeah, why? I'm um, not sure I'm following you. I would assume that lots of parents need to know this to make decisions moving forward and to wait another month to know if we're going one way or another is just um, something they've probably been really familiar with for a while now. And I think that we need to make a decision and, um, and have data that we're going to be using and, and go with that and do that in a faster fashion than waiting until the next school board. Well, it's Chris's motion, so she can revise it if she wants to, but I'm having a hard time coming up with an alternative because so, we have to put a date on it with mask optional until a period of time. Mm -hmm. So we have to put something on there. Okay, so I'll support that motion as long as the understanding is. We'll get this done fast. Yes, thank you. I don't disagree with you. And I, I want that said in the minutes, too, because I think that's important, um, is to expedite the process. and. Again, I want to appreciate all the work that we're doing is think like it's creative, it's thinking in the gray, it's customized to stratum, and I really like that. Um, but my motion is going to remain the same with the intent of expediting the process. Um, but for intensive purposes of the first day of school, especially, I think this meeting we need to have parents know how to prepare their children. And I mean, even I was like, do I load up on masks? Do I not? Like, what do I do? Like, um, so. Okay. Well, it is because nobody pulled it back. All right. We ready to vote? Mm -hmm. It's like playing um, rock, paper, scissors. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. One, two, three, four. Opposed? Aye. So we're four, one, zero. We're not usually split. Okay. So that motion passes. We will open mask optional and create a decision tree, matrix, whatever we need so that our administration knows what to do. And we'll get that done in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Is that complicated? I don't know. Okay. We'll figure it out. I, get I do that. want to appreciate everyone's expertise here. I mean, the mask man, and, and we have a lot of different people coming from different avenues giving their input, and everybody is What's a next? nurse. Uh, I mean, never met a card pediatric cardiac nurse. So I think that's really great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We do need to move on. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Are you going to revisit the thing about rapid tests in the school or no? Um, we can. We need to ask if that's what we want to revisit. I would say yes. yes. So let's make a request. Esther, can we look into that for yeah, rapid? I can't hear the conversation down there. Sorry. Can we look into rapid tests for stratum? Mm -hmm. Cost, whatever. I just want to make sure we are actually asking. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, so moving on, next we are on to old business. And that brings us to building committee update. Jeez, have you guys had time? We have not met, so we- <laughs> The update is we have not met. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say, well, the update is we have not met. Do we know our, um, we have a, a needs assessment presentation, don't we, Kate, coming up? I believe that's in November or December. November, so we've got, okay. Do we need to make a plan to meet before that? Okay, so in other words, we don't have any update there yet. Okay. Yeah, what about the survey? Do we need to vote on that? Sure. No, I don't think so. Okay, it's just gonna happen. Yeah, okay. so we just need to get our questions. Who's okay. gonna do that? Well, I figured I would. Oh, you're awesome. That's what I do for a living, so yeah, I might as well. All right, that so. lovely stuff. Um, I'm making notes, sorry. Next, we have visitor policy. We said we would revisit this. So, up to this point, well, all through last year, we had no visitors in the building. Is there a recommendation? They're allowing. Oops, I'm on the wrong page. 
No, that's a, that's a no, the policy. That's, um, is that the email the second email? It was in the yeah, thing that Mr. had. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. I, I have a lot of paper here. It speaks to school building use. Okay. Which groups and teams seeking to use the school building spaces for meetings, sports, and other activities will be permitted to do so without any additional costs. That was the prorated cost or additional cost for custodial services. And then they would use the normal building use forms. Um, visitors in general, I think you're, we're going with visitors are, are in your building. And again, on a case-by-case -case basis, I think you as a board probably want to decide, do you want all visitors? Um, or do you want visitors that are pertaining to educational programming? In other words, do you want visitors coming into classrooms doing um, a birthday party or something like that, which sometimes happens? Or do you want to define what visitors are that are pertinent to an educational program? For example, someone that's coming in from a science program to deliver something to a classroom. And that's up to the board. Um, I have to say, I was thinking meeting sports and other activities were um, not visitors. So when I read that, I wasn't thinking visitors. I was thinking we're opening the use of our building. Um, so my preference would be to not have a lot of visitors in the building. Um, educational visitors, people who are here to teach and to learn, et cetera. Let's focus on learning, let's focus on teaching. Um, for that purpose, it's fine with me. Birthday parties and parents coming in and all of that. Uh, hullabaloo, hullabaloo, I would prefer not to have that. That's my opinion. I agree. What's your opinion down there? It's hard to talk with I know. guys like this. No, I think we, that's a good starting point. I mean, we're um, voting to have our students be without math, so we at least need to think about some other mitigation factors, and that would be an important one. Mm -hmm. I'm in agreement with you. I mean, I know the SAFE program is really important here, and I, I think we should be able to allow the SAFE program to participate, but they should be masked. Um, Do we know what the plan was for the SAFE program? Right, but why would you mask SAFE but not yeah, classrooms? I don't know about that. Because one's learning and one's play? So, well, they learn through play, yeah. but the goal it's of SAFE education is to learn. The goal of SAFE is to keep kids safe before and after school. So well, what is It's your, group play. It is group but play. But what was the plan, I'm oh, sorry, what was the plan for SAFE? What, what were they thinking? Outdoors, no masks, right? The YMCA plan, they, 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 they're building, we don't get paid what they do, they're building it. We don't govern that. That's but did they share what their plan was for that? Can we find that out? Okay. That's a different YMCA, but yeah. Same. Okay. I think what they're saying is we can't tell safe to mask or not mask. Well, I don't know about oh, that. So extra Y is masking indoors, but the safe program is with the extra Y. I guess I'm just saying the recommendation is for anybody using the building, if they're using the building, where I know what that recommendation is, and they'll use the building and not under my purview, I have no say on what they do with the building. But we do, right? If they're using the building and we expect. No, I don't think so. I think you could say you may not use the building. I don't think you can dictate what they do within their program. You don't, they're not their boss. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No, no, it's not. It's the truth. Um, okay, so we should find out on our side what their plan is for how they're going to handle children sure. indoors versus outdoors. So I understand. I don't, yeah, I don't think that's what we're talking about. I think we think just want to find out what their safety protocols are, what their plans are for right. the program indoors versus outdoor, outside. They're connected, I believe, they're connected to the Exeter um, so the program and, and, and they're mass inside and not outside. Okay. I'm comfortable with that. I am too, so I, I just wanted to know.
It does, but our matrix is not going to be tighter than theirs, than their matrix. So, and we already have a contract. So I was thinking, one's not contingent on the other. My preference would be, if we actually had a say on it, would be to prioritize learning, kids in classrooms, over kids playing and having fun in the, in the building. That would be my preference, but since we can't change that we've already got a contract and they're gonna be here, um, I would just like to know what they're planning to do, because we apparently can't do anything about it. Well, I'm okay with what they're planning for their opening, but I don't know what they're, yeah. And how we keep in touch with that. I'm on their web, um, I'm on their email list for how they change the guardrails at the, at the Y and stuff like that, so. <laughs> But it's not going to be looser than what we're talking about, just considering stratum. That's all right. I'm not sure I was clear. OK. Any, oh, where were we? Um, so visitors. I think we should have allow safe. Well, we have to. They're already contracted. Well, still what I think. OK. And then I don't think we should have visitors. Um, I'll make a motion to allow visitors that are connected to educational programming. Before, can we have discussed it? Oh, we have to well, say I have a motion, second. then we can discuss oh. it. Yep. No second? I'll second it for discussion, right? right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. What does that mean? Can you give examples of definition? Yeah, sure. So, um, educational programming could be. Um, the Seacoast Science Center comes into the building to do a presentation to fifth grade class, something like that. So it's educationally based. That it's not birthday parties, it's um, purposeful, it's meeting competencies and standards, it's allowing for the way that we've educated before. Because as Erin pointed out, play is educational. So I just want to make sure that we, as, as I process this, we understand what education means and... Well, I think I said educational programming. I'm not sure the play is a program, per right, se. Right, right. Um, okay. Can I'm okay with that prioritization because okay. I feel like the... We want to get back to as normal a school year as we can have. Um, Do they come in master and? Mass? Having, um, the way other school districts do it, if it's mask optional, it's mask optional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the You're not going to then all of a sudden yeah. be like, well, not for you, and for you, and not for you. That it's makes just sense. mask optional. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. What about for people that, I just know of a couple people that um, volunteer in classrooms or in the library or whatever? Is that? So that would That's be like a, no. a different um, no. category. So you have to, we have to first think about visitors, and then we have to think yeah. about volunteers. Those are okay. two different categories. Got it. Sure. So, who made this motion? Sarah. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead. I was just thinking, you, what was your distinction in that motion? That volunteers are not visitors. So visitor, yeah, and in our, all of our policies, there are definitions of visitors versus volunteers. Oh, so that's point. very clear. And so what I'm saying is um, I make a motion to allow visitors for the purpose of educational programming, okay. which is different than volunteers. All right. So what were you going to say, Erin? So these are people whose profession it is to go from school to school and sit in a classroom unmasked with our children and then go into another school. So we go say that person has the Delta variant, which is incredibly contagious. They're going from building to building as their profession every day without a mask on. That's what, that's what we're talking about. That's a good point. That is a good point. You're smart. I have to think a minute. Um, I have another question. So, how many educationally focused visitors do we have at a time per year? And do they go? I'm going to ask Kate. Um, do they go school to school? Or are they SAU people?
And how many people, like a week, do we have that are like that coming to, into our school? I would say we do one week. So it's rare. Once a month? Uh, yeah, maybe across the next one So, for instance, like I know one year a yoga instructor came in. Yeah. That would be permissible under that. Yeah. Um, we could say they can do their programming outdoors in space if it's something that the teacher deems that they want to do. We don't have to say absolutely nobody can, you know, there's a, there's a way to do this reasonably. But I can tell you, my kids wouldn't be going to school that day or possibly a few days after. And the um, point here is to keep our kids in school. Yep, totally. So what if we required masks on visitors who came? for educational programming. Masks work both ways. They protect the, the wearer and the audience. So that doesn't solve it. But the matrix does. I, I prefer not to have masks, uh, have the visitors. Um, especially once we go into November, unless we want to visit this again, like it, we, we did the mask policy, once we go into a cold and flu season, Aaron, you make a really good point. Any other questions? Discussion? I hope it doesn't follow cold and flu season. So it, but it's compounded and exacerbated. Yep. By people being inside. As, as yeah. is the Delta variant. Right. Could we just say if they're outside for now until we revisit it? Well, I don't know that we need the motion. I mean, if they're outdoors, haven't we allowed people outdoors anyway last year? It was the indoors was the issue. We allowed no visitors indoor outdoors from the very end of the school when we allowed it for outside. And it's standing like, even on the new example of the fifth grade clap off, we did not allow the adults even outside to interact with our children. They had to be in a separate section, kept in separate environment. Okay. So, do we want to vote up and down on how we have it, or do, Sarah, do you want to make an adjustment? As it is right now, it's a motion. All visitors connected to educational programming will be allowed. And mask optional if that's the policy of the school, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to make a change, or do you want to keep it as is? I'll keep it and we'll just see how we go. Okay. All right. So it's the fun part. Um, again? Pardon? Could um, you again? Motion. We will allow visitors connected to educational programming um, and following the mass protocol of the building at the time. Okay. Okay. Um, all those in favor, and I'm not quite decided yet, so I need a minute. <laughs> okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, we are two to three, two, three, zero, and that fails. Okay, so anything else we want to do with visitors? Can we talk about volunteers? And if, cause well, I've we haven't made a decision on visitors, right? Other than, correct. yeah, we need to make a decision on visitors. That motion failed, but that doesn't mean that something else carry oh, right yeah so, yeah so yeah, we yeah, have sorry, to sorry. yeah so what's our what's going to be our decision on visitors i'd like to make a motion i take it back i don't know what my motion is this is a tough one just by the same logic you can't have volunteers in the school if you can't have educational programming, people going from here to here to here, volunteers you've got volunteers going from here to here to here to here. But they're coming from Stratum, probably. probably. They're not, I know, that they're residents, the volunteers are usually parents, but. 
I'd like to make a motion, no visitors. Until we revisit it in maybe after we do a workshop, develop a matrix, and have a better understanding of how we're moving forward. Okay. Can clarify that compared to the school building use that we just discussed. Use yes. school building spaces for meetings, sports, and other activities. Those are not visitors. It needs to be outside of school hours. So during school hours, I make a motion that we not allow visitors into the building until we develop a matrix or until we reconvene next meeting to regroup and have a better fundamental understanding of what we're doing. Um, honestly, I, I feel like that is not very clear. I feel like we need a motion um, and then we can revise it in the future. Like we can make a policy and then change it. So making it contingent upon having this other decision, I, I don't. We establish it for now and then revisit it. And then become more specific when we have a foundation of matrix and how we're moving forward. So you wanna put a date? During school hours, no visitors until? Until we recon uh, the next meeting. Basically at the ne next meeting, our hope is to have a new matrix and a I'm not sure why visitors are contingent on the matrix. I see the matrix as the development of a plan, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of an individualized stratum plan. Mm -hmm. And right now, that's in the works. And I see this visitor component as being in the works. Does that make sense? Yeah. What is, um, what more information do you need around visitors, a definition of visitor, what is, what is holding up the board on this? Um, I think we should have just a straight up and down decision on visitors. I agree. And what kinds of visitors? Well, no visitors. And volunteers today. and things like that. And we should put it in place and let it stand, and then we can revisit it whenever we want. I mean, we can always pull back and do something different at any board meeting. So what was wrong with that? I don't like that we're going to come back to it in September, which is so just a few it. weeks away. Um, I think we need to make a decision, like we did last year. We said no visitors, well, period. that was my original motion, and then you said it wasn't. My original motion is not to have visitors, and then you said we need to revise. because of the, because of this. So we added in during school hours, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can't change your motion, but I would suggest that we drop the part about visiting it, revisiting it in the, at the next meeting or the meeting after that. It's make a decision so and then we can always come back if we want to i'm going to rescind that motion and i'll make a motion not to have visitors during in school hours okay indoors and outdoors period okay And in my mind, visitors encompass volunteers. If you are a non-staff member. So that visitors right. and volunteers. Yes. Anybody who's assigned in. Let's make it, just make it clear, right? Not to have visitors and volunteers during school hours. What about IEP meetings? Those can be done through Zoom, is that permissible? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yes. All right, do we have a second? Happening there. 
We do not have a second. Um, um, I'll second it so we can have more discussion and then we can vote it up or down. Okay, so what is the impact of making a decision like this to have no visitors or volunteers during school hours? Kate, sorry, going right to you. So was there, was there a significant educational impact? There's so many impacts. You're right. No, I understand. Okay, so Aaron, you had a comment? If we're trying to make this year feel normal, visitors outside, in distanced seems reasonable. Put them under a tent, six feet away, 12 feet away if you want to. Kids can listen to a meteorologist talking from 15 feet away. But the goal here is to make it feel normal and keep them in school. So have visitors outside. Don't have parents come into the classroom and sit down and read a book. Put them outside at a table and have them read a book. So that would lead, make it the teacher's responsibility to make sure that we're not taking turns petting something or passing around a book. That would, whose responsibility would that fall on that that does not happen? Why would that be a problem? I mean, how many times do you sit around and they pass around, you look at it? I mean, that's some of the best part of having groups. So the teacher would ensure that, not the, not the volunteer or the person. Okay. Okay. So I can't amend your motion. Are I can. You willing? Okay. I think that's a great idea, Erin. So not to have visitors and volunteers indoors during school hours. Okay, it's really just the confined, we're just confined on the indoors. Okay, um, I guess I second it. I don't know if I need a second again. All right, are we ready to vote? Okay, Can you just read it one more time? Okay, um, making a motion to not have visitors and volunteers indoors during school hours. Okay, okay, um, okay all those in favor? And I'll go five two. I don't want to be the tiebreaker. Five zero zero. On that, that was painful. Okay. Um, anything else on visitors we need to handle? So we've settled when visitors can be here, when volunteers can be here, where they can be here. I think that's all the pieces of volunteers. Would you agree, Esther? We covered it. Okay. All right. Next, we have new business. Do we have any? Nothing that can Okay, we'll skip over that. Nobody has any new business. Um, we will have a non-public, but uh, closing comments. We have closing comments first? Okay, closing comments. Um, I don't really have any other than thank you for everybody showing up, being respectful, and enduring the heat. It's been difficult. Um, but I appreciate, you know, everybody's participation and that we seem to be in a pretty good spot, although we do have some work we need to do before we can open up school um, in about 10 days, right? days um, so thank you everyone good night we will be having a non-public session so we will see you